Hello, viewers. Today, we're very fortunate to be joined by award-winning journalist and author Ari Berman. So welcome. Hi, thank you for having me, Rama. So I have a first question lined up for you, which is when you were growing up, did you think that one day you would be doing what you're doing now? Good question. When I was five, probably not. I probably wanted to be a baseball player or an astronaut or one of those cool things that kids dream of being. Um, maybe as I got older, I mean, I was I got interested in journalism uh, later in high school, maybe 16 or 17. Uh, I was always curious. Uh, I was a good writer. Uh, I was a bit of a pain in the ass. And those are qualities that all uh, end up for making good journalists, usually. Absolutely. Um, and um, this is your second book, right? So yes, what, Give Us the Ballad is my second book. Right. So what what prompted you to write this one and, and what why and, and how were you interested in this particular topic? Well, I was covering the topic of voting rights as a journalist um, before it really became a big thing. Um, I was one of the first journalists to cover um, the attack on voting rights that occurred uh, after the 2010 election when a lot of key states uh, flipped under Republican control. Uh, and I knew that in 2015, which is now quite a long time ago, we were coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, this monumental piece of civil rights legislation. Uh, and I wanted to really tell the story of what the Voting Rights Act did, because there were so many books about the civil rights movement, but they tended to stop with the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965 as this huge climactic event uh, that finally uh, African Americans and other historically disenfranchised groups had won the right to vote. And my question was, well, what happened after 1965? Uh, and I was surprised that no one had really written an accessible history of the Voting Rights Act that not only talked about the history, but tied in to what was happening in the present day. So that's really what led me um, to write my book, Give Us the Ballot. Awesome. And and because we're, you know, we're Massachusetts, so we're the home of gerrymandering as, as witnessed in 1812. And so do you think that there continues to be a relationship between gerrymandering and voting rights today? Absolutely. Um, voter suppression and gerrymandering are basically two sides of the same coin. Um, they're attempts by politicians to try to pick their own electorate. Uh, and sometimes that is done by putting barriers in front of people. Sometimes it's done by just surgically drawing them into districts where the outcomes are predetermined. And unfortunately, something that happens in both blue states and in red states, and I think it's a real problem because I think most people uh, find it fundamentally unfair that politicians would draw districts to try to preserve their own power. I mean, you wouldn't hire yourself in a job interview. Um, I mean, everyone would like to hire themselves in a job right. interview, but it doesn't really work that way. Um, but that's really what's happening because of gerrymandering. So I think it is a problem. I think it's a bipartisan problem. I think probably more recently, Republicans have done it more um, and more aggressively. And I think Democrats have been more willing to try to support alternatives to gerrymandering. Um, but it's certainly a bipartisan problem that has existed for a long, long time. Um, but I think the public's more aware of it now than they were maybe 10, 20 years ago. So, so for those of us um, who've lived through the 60s here and are very familiar with the civil rights movement, as well as some of the immediate gains and pushbacks, um, that were realized with the passage of the Voting Rights Act, um, it's easier for that crowd to remember. But, but for those who are post-60s, for the post-60s crowd, might you slightly outline for us some of the events that led up to the, the passage of the VRA? Yeah, well, I'm in the post-60s crowd, obviously. Uh, I was born in 1982, so this was new history for me as well. I, mean, I remember reading um, about the Voting Rights Act, but to go back and research it, it really came alive for me. And you know, before the passage of the Voting Rights Act, I think a lot of people would have been shocked by the situation in the Jim Crow South, that in places like Mississippi, only 6% of African Americans were registered to vote. There were counties in Alabama that were 80% Black, where there wasn't a single black registered voter. And there were a large variety of tactics used to try to disenfranchise African Americans from literacy tests to poll taxes to grandfather clauses to property requirements. If you wanted uh, to register to vote in a place like Selma, Alabama, for example, you had to name all 67 county judges to get on the voting rolls, um, something that the county judges themselves would have never been able to do. And there was this very famous march on March 7th, 1965, called Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama, 
where uh, John Lewis, longtime civil rights activist who, who passed away in 2020, led this march across a bridge in Selma, Alabama. Uh, he and others were brutally beaten, and that footage was broadcast to the entire country, and it really stirred the conscience of the nation and led President Lyndon Johnson to introduce the Voting Rights Act eight days later. And, and I think you mentioned um, Bloody Sunday, am I correct in assuming? Yes, Bloody you, Sunday is what it was called. So so, so why do you think that um, um, that had such a profound and quick response while more recent and ongoing events like, you know, uh, mass shootings, you know, Sandy Hook, the police violence like in, in um, that we recently saw, um, it, it, you know, why have those things not resulted in quick legislative action? That's a good question. I mean, on the one hand, the disenfranchisement of black voters did not result in quick legislative action. It had been going on for decades in the Jim Crow South. I mean, once Reconstruction ended uh, in the South around the late 1860s, early 1870s, you had decades after decades after decades where black voters were disenfranchised and the federal government didn't do anything about it. So on the one hand, you could argue that it took a very long time um, for action on these issues. Uh, but I think that the nation reached a breaking point. Bloody Sunday in Selma wasn't the first protest. It wasn't the first march. It, a lot of things happened before that. You had the sit-ins, you had the freedom rides, you had the March on Washington, you had the passage of the Civil Rights Act, all of that happened before and then there was after all those things had happened there was this demand that finally there had to be voting rights that the right to vote had to be granted to black americans and those demands had been echoed for a long time but it was really bloody sunday that made people see this is how people are being treated simply for trying to register to vote and it cut across um, political lines it cr cut across partisan lines and i just think the imagery of that happening um was so moving to people that it forced them to act. But remember, it was preceded by 70 to 100 years of the federal government not really doing anything to protect the voting rights of blacks or other uh, disenfranchised minorities. Okay. Um, so um, so did, the, did the VRA, the passage of the VRA change um, who voted um, after its passage? Yes, it dramatically changed who voted. Um, it enfranchised first uh, many African Americans who had been disenfranchised. Then the Act's protections were expanded to what became known as language minority groups. So um, Hispanics and others who did not have English as a first language, um, they were enfranchised by the law, which had, that had a big impact for Latinos in Texas or Asian Americans uh, in California or um, Native Americans on reservations. Lots of different communities were enfranchised by the Voting Rights Act. And I think it really uh, made America a true multiracial democracy for the first time, because before that, really, you had a situation where whites were enfranchised and most other groups were not in large numbers. And so the Voting Rights Act changed uh, that situation. It created the electorate uh, that was possible, for example, to elect the first black president um, and so many other historic gains that we've seen in recent years. So, so the Voting Rights Act has multiple sections. Um, and I think two of the most impactful sections are, are sections four and five. And uh, would you explain to us why those two are so important and, and impactful? Yeah, so one of the things the Voting Rights Act did was after it struck down those suppressive devices that prevented people from registering and voting, it said that those states that had the longest histories of discrimination actually had to approve their voting changes with the federal government, um, largely in the South, but not exclusively. And this was so powerful because if Alabama wanted to pass a new literacy test or a new poll tax, which of course they wanted to do, they had to clear that with the federal government. And the federal government was able to block discrimination before it had ever even occurred. I mean, it was akin to stopping a crime before it had been committed, which is a very powerful thing and a very unique power that was written into the Voting Rights Act. And that stopped thousands of discriminatory voting changes from being put into effect from 1965 until 2013, when the Supreme Court gutted uh, the heart of the Voting Rights Act and said that those states with that history of discrimination no longer had to approve their voting changes anymore. Um, and so in the, um, I think, was it 2011 Supreme Court Shelby versus Holder? 2013 it, Shelby 2013. County versus Holder. Right, yeah. and it was deemed that sections four and five were unconstitutional. Um, could you tell us what happened then? 
Yeah, it was deemed um, that basically the formula under which these states were covered and had to approve their voting changes was un unconstitutional. So it meant that those states with a long history of discrimination, places like Texas and Georgia uh, and Alabama, they no longer needed to get approval for those voting changes. And so we, we began to see a wave of new efforts to try to make it harder to vote. Um, that predated Trump, that have accelerated uh, after Trump, uh, during Trump, and then after Trump. Uh, and basically, that decision really laid the groundwork for a lot of the voter suppression efforts that we're seeing today, because these these efforts are not happening exclusively in the South, um, but I think they were driven in large part by states in the South. Um, and one of the Supreme Court justices referred to it as old poison and new bottles. And I think that's what we're seeing today. Um, and, and what changes were made by some legislatures to limit or restrict voting rights? A lot of different changes, um, requiring forms of ID to vote that you never needed before, um, cutting back on early voting, uh, making it easier to remove people uh, from the voting rolls, uh, redrawing district lines in discriminatory ways. Uh, up until recently, efforts to try to potentially subvert elections, overturn elections. Um, we've seen uh, more than half the states in the country change their voting laws in some form or another uh, in the last decade to make it harder to vote. Uh, and some of these things are very obvious, some of these things are less obvious, um, but basically in states with a long history of discrimination and in states that are largely controlled by Republicans, we've seen every aspect of the voting process come under attack. So um, your extensive research um, and study on this topic, in your opinion, um, what can what do you think can be done to assure voting rights and representation and, and that representation and rights are protected in the future going forward? Well, I think it's really important that we have strong federal legislation um, protecting the right to vote. Uh, the Voting Rights Act has been severely weakened um, by the Supreme Court, and the Congress hasn't taken any action to strengthen it, which I think is unfortunate. I think we also need protections beyond the Voting Rights Act, because the Voting Rights Act deals with uh, racial discrimination in voting uh, in certain states in particular. But I think we need broader protections for that. I think we need universal um, protections uh, for voting rights, guaranteeing that people have things like early voting um, in every state and that voting is as accessible and convenient as possible. Some states are taking those efforts. Places like Massachusetts are doing a pretty good job of that, but other states are going backwards. Places like Georgia, places like Texas are moving in the other direction. What concerns me is that we're becoming kind of a two-tiered society when it comes to the right to vote, where it's easy to vote in some states and harder to vote in other states. And that's a lot like what the situation situation was before the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965, where in some places uh, blacks could vote. Um, and in fact, there were black members of Congress and things like that, places like New York. And then in some places, um, almost all black voters were disenfranchised. And that's exactly the two-tiered democracy um, that the Voting Rights Act was meant to stop. And I think it's also just important that people get involved wherever they are. Um, because I think a lot of times people in kind of bluer areas, people like Massachusetts say, well, what does it matter um, what we do here? But I mean, what we're seeing is that states are models and states can either be a good model or a bad model. And if you're a good model, that's something that other states can follow. And maybe it'll only be a handful of states, but maybe the political dynamics will change or maybe public opinion will change or maybe perceptions will change and people will say, hey, that's a good idea. Um, we should do that in more places. Um, so I think it, it's really important that people just get involved where they live because as much as everyone wants to get involved in a place like Georgia or a place like Texas, I think that uh, in states where these battles aren't as contentious, that gives you an opportunity to do something good. Um, and to try that only that not only helps people in the places where you live, in places like Massachusetts, but it also creates an alternative model for other states to follow. Perfect. And and what would you say to people, um, for example, in small towns um, such as ours, um, to encourage them to come out and vote? Well, I would say that local elections are really important. Um, in a lot of ways, they matter more to your life um, than big national elections. Uh, and usually there's very low turnout in those kind of local elections. Most people don't know who their city council members are or who um, their local state reps are, things like that. And, and that, that, that matters a lot. And it matters a lot for the issues that people really care about. I mean, a lot of the, the things that people care about today um, happen at the local and state level. So uh, I, I would urge people to try to get involved in their local elections. 
your vote really, really matters in those elections. I mean, sometimes it's hard for people to tell people in Massachusetts your vote really matters in a presidential election, right? Um, but where everyone knows the outcome. But in a local race, in a in a city council race or a state legislative race, one vote really matters, and that's where someone not just their vote, but if they want to volunteer or contribute money or get involved or become a poll worker, all of that stuff matters a lot more in local elections. Perfect. Well, perfect. And is there anything else you'd like to add? About no, the- I'm looking forward to visiting soon. Awesome. And and thank you. We're we're so excited um, for you to be partnering with the World of Wellesley, the League of Women Voters, Wellesley College, and Wellesley Books. And we're really looking forward to seeing you um, towards the end of this month in Wellesley. Awesome. So thank Thanks you so, much so, so very much. Thank you.